Well, good morning. Let's, uh, let's open with prayer this morning, and then we'll dive in. Our Father in heaven, Lord, if we could not trust you, I don't know what we would do. I don't know how people live in this world uncertain of what the future and uncertain of what their eternal destiny are. I don't know how people live in this world without understanding uh, that there is an amazing, powerful, wonderful God that has created us and that He has a plan for this world and that He cares for His people. God, we are thankful to know You and we're thankful to uh, have learned about You through Your Word. And I pray that You would encourage us this morning as we look at Your Word and look at the history of your word, and that you would overcome the weaknesses of your servant, Lord, and feed your sheep. We pray these things in your name. Amen. So this week and the next two weeks are going to be a little bit different. Uh, We're going to, instead of opening our Bible and looking at particular verses this morning, we're going to be talking about our Bible and talking about the history of our Bible and how we got it. Some of you might think, well, why should we spend Sunday mornings not in our Bibles, but outside looking at the Bible? And there's a very important reason for that. Uh, In my opinion, uh, we are entering into a time of tremendous uncertainty that is going to affect the church greatly moving forward. Uh, We are a people uh, who are, we have been under attack and that attack is not going anywhere. That attack is going to get stronger. Uh, if you've read anything about the Equality Act, the Equality Act is effectively the government's intervention into the life of the church that basically deems the Bible's teaching about sexuality and gender as discrimination. And through the Equality Act, there will be the ability to reach into Christian organizations, even Christian schooling, and other, and other areas of Christian life to effectively say what Christians are doing is teaching hate speech and discrimination. And they're going to attack the Bible. They're going to say that the Bible, what Christians believe, what they have believed for hundreds and, and 2,000 years, this is unreliable. You cannot trust what the Bible says. You need to compromise in this area, and you need to back away from what the, the Bible teaches. If we understand where our Bible comes from, we will be able to withhold and withstand in these attacks that come against the Scriptures, and we will be able to have confidence in what God has given us in the Scripture to stand firm and to stand with God. This is not something new. Uh, The Bible has been being attacked uh, literally for 2,000 years since the time of Christ, uh, and it's been happening most, most of the time, either on the internet or on university campuses. Uh, this is one of the leading reasons why uh, the demographics of children who grow up in the church and then go off to secular universities, why more than 80% of these students, quote-unquote, lose their faith because they enter into university believing that the Bible is true but not really understanding why or understanding why the Bible is reliable. And they get to college and they have uh, very bright professors who are able to distort the facts of reality and cause unsuspecting Christians to doubt their faith and eventually lose their faith in what they had been taught their entire lives. There are are famous people uh, who make a living off of discrediting the Bible. Uh, One of the most famous in the last 20 years was a man named Dan Brown. Dan Brown was the author of the uh, multi-million dollar, uh, uh, millions of copies sold, The Da Vinci Code. was on the bestseller list, uh, New York Times bestseller for more than a year. Uh, That was eventually developed into a movie. If you ever watched The Da Vinci Code, the whole point of this movie is that uh, there has been a secret kept from the world that Jesus and Mary Magdalene were actually married and they had children, and that there's a secret society that has been keeping this truth from all of the world. And this is something that Dan Brown, uh, in his book, he wrote about the Bible. This is a quote about the Bible. Man created it as a historical record of tumultuous times, 
And it has evolved through the countless translations, additions, and revisions. History has never had a definitive version of this book. Millions and millions of people read that book. Millions and millions of people uh, watched his movie. He is just one of many who believe that, uh, that there is not a uh, definitive Bible or even a Bible that's in relative agreement, but that the Bible is a, basically a fluid book that as it's been translated from one language to another, it's as if the telephone game is being played. If you know what the telephone game is, somebody starts with a message. Like I would tell Brother John a message I'd whispered into his ear. And then he would whisper that message to Gene, and then Gene to Sean, and Sean to Mary Beth, and Mary Beth to Greg. And by the time we get through the whole room, the message that ends at the end with Brother Art in the back is totally different, completely different than what I gave to Brother John here. That's how people view the translation and transmission of the text of Scripture, that what was originally written is lost, and what we have today is simply an evolution of what once was. There are others, especially in university campuses, that latch onto a man named Bart Ehrman. Bart Ehrman was a professing Christian. He is now an apostate. He denies the faith of Christianity. He is the leading New Testament scholar, uh, really in America, who is an unbeliever. Uh, He's written many books. Uh, One of his most famous is a book called Misquoting Jesus. Uh, And here's what he writes in his book. My book isn't questioning at all whether God is true or not. The question is whether the New Testament can give us access to this truth of God. And my question is, how can it do so if we don't know what words were in the scriptures. Now, this man is a very bright man, and he's a man who literally speaks out of both sides of his mouth. He will, in one setting, affirm that what we have in the Bible is so accurate, uh, uh, such an accurate representation of all of the evidence that we have, and then in the next breath say, but you can't trust it. And you can't trust it because we don't have the originals. And so he, he represents a view that would be dubbed radical skepticism, that if you do not have the originals, then you can't trust anything that has come afterwards. But the logical uh, conclusion to that type of argument is, well, then you can't trust anything from antiquity. You can't trust absolutely anything about Roman history or, or anything that we have prior to the printing press, because for many things, we just don't have the originals. And so what I'm going to be talking about today and in the next uh, two weeks are questions that I myself have wrestled with heavily and have needed answers to. Uh, I've, I've needed to know where the Bible comes from, but it's just something I have to know. I have to know that the Bible is trustworthy. I have to know the history of this book that I'm staking my eternity on, and I, I want you to know these things as well. I want you to have a firm foundation, because in this time of uncertainty, what we need most is to see that there are trustworthy, reliable truths that we as Christians can latch onto. And the one who gives us those truths is God himself, and he has preserved those truths for us in his word. And he wants us to know these things. So here's our goals. Our goal today, how did we get the Bibles that we have today? I want to bridge the gap from the, uh, in particular about the New Testament from the first century till now. How did we get the Bibles that we have today? Next week, can we trust the Bible? Uh, One of the difficult things that we have to wrestle with as Christians is just facts, reality. Uh, We have manuscripts of the Bible, and none of the manuscripts are identical. And so what we have, where we have differences between manuscripts, is we have what's called textual variants. We have to know what these are. We have to understand what does this mean. And so we're going to look at that extensively next week. And then finally, we have differences in Bible translations. We have so many English Bibles, uh, and there are really only two reasons why Bible translations are different. Uh, They are using one of two different texts, which makes them different, or they have a different translation philosophy, the method behind how they're translating is different. And so we're going to examine those things as well. So 
today, we're going to start off with just some general things, and then we're going to move into uh, the second half of this morning. It's going to be more of a timeline, kind of walking through uh, some major historical events. You are not going to remember everything that I say, because I'm going to give you a lot of information. But that's what this fact sheet is for that you're holding in your hand. They're in the back if you didn't grab it. There's going to be a lot of information that you're going to get. Some of you are hearing these things for the first time. Some of you, maybe this may be the second or third time that you've ever heard these things. But these are uh, important things for us to know with regard to how we received our Bibles so that we can know that they're trustworthy, so that we can know that God and His Word are reliable. Let me take another drink real quick. Let's compare some things from now from the first century. Believe it or not, our Bibles were not originally written in English. They come from a different language. Uh, English was not uh, even in existence in the first century. Uh, the Old Testament of our Bibles was originally written in Hebrew, and in the New Testament, it was written in Greek. There's a little bit in the Old Testament that's Aramaic, but it's, it's only a really small portion of the Old Testament. For most of Christian history, the Bible was not put together in a, in a book of Old and New Testament together. Uh, and in fact, most Christians throughout history didn't have... Uh, personally, maybe more than a page of Scripture or maybe a, uh, a chapter of Scripture and sometimes even one book of the Bible. And so we have a lot of modern inventions in our Bibles with uh, verse divisions, chapter divisions, uh, leather bound. Uh, these are all modern inventions that we have been given for convenience for us of using our Bibles, preserving them, keeping them um, keeping them safe. What did the early Christians have? What did, a, what did a first or second or third century Christian have? What they had was a papyrus manuscript. They had uh, papyrus was an inexpensive material similar to our notebook paper. It's not a material that's designed to last forever. Over time, it would fall apart, literally disintegrate. Uh, it's made from a plant, a papyrus plant. They'd cut strips of it. They'd make a uh, vertical strips, glue it together, then put horizontal strips on top of it, glue that together and smash it down, and then they'd have like a piece of paper that you could write on both sides of. Uh, we often think uh, that what the early church had were they walked around with scrolls, like big scrolls that they wrote on. Uh, it is unlikely uh, that they used scrolls because anything that we have found has not been in the form of a scroll for the New Testament. They've been in the, in the form of a codex or a book. Like if you imagine modern books like we have, you have loose paper, but it's bound on one end so that you can easily open it. That's what we have found. Uh, and that's likely for a number of reasons. Number one, scrolls are expensive. You can only write on one side. Number two, scrolls are so large that it's really difficult and cumbersome to try to just open up a scroll and find what you're looking for. Uh, for instance, the book of Acts, it's a very long book. Uh, this would be a perfect example of how big a scroll could be. To put the book of Acts on a scroll, that scroll would need to be nearly 30 feet long. Now, if you could try to imagine, oh, I need to get to Acts 15, the Council of Jerusalem. I've got to unroll 20 feet of scroll to try to just navigate through what I'm looking for. Christians found that uh, using a codex or a book was much easier to navigate and to find what they were looking for. Now, we're going to talk a lot about, I mean, you hear the word manuscript a lot this morning, and that's because since our Bibles weren't written in English, the only way that we can have it in English is we have to have evidence of the Bible in its original language. And we do have evidence of them in manuscripts. These are documents that we have found that are copies of the original New Testament. This is a picture here of a papyrus, Papyrus 66. Uh, in all of the, the documentation, if you see a P and then a number, that P means papyrus. Papyrus are the oldest of the documents of the New Testament that we have. This particular document is of the Gospel of John. This is the oldest copy of the Gospel of John that we have from the year AD, 60, sorry, AD 200. And you can see, like, on the edges of the document that they're, um, they're like, is there a, oh, no, I hit the wrong button. I'm sorry, Joel. I totally turned it off. I meant to hit the, the laser. It's the top one. There we go. Oh, there we go. Thank you, Joel. All right. 
You can see like on the edges, the book is falling apart. Where, where they would touch it would fall. Uh, the, there's like these little holes in it. Um, not every manuscript that we have looks this good. Uh, this looks pretty good. Um, but this is from the year 8200, and this is go- John's gospel. Uh, we would think, uh, does this actually read how our gospel reads in the gospel of John? And the answer is yes. Why don't you follow along with me? En arche, en halagos, kai halagos, en prostan theon, theos en halagos. What does that mean? Well, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Uh, Just as we read in our Bibles in John's Gospel, chapter 1, that's just what we find in the manuscript tradition, that we we have preserved what we have found, and we translate it into English. And so the evidence that we have of our New Testament is very similar to what we have in our Bibles today. Now, these manuscripts are really difficult to read, these are unseal manuscripts or majuscule manuscripts, and what that means is that all the letters are capitals, and that there are no spaces between words, and there's no punctuation, and so they're very difficult for a layperson to read. Uh, over time, the form of these manuscripts changed, uh, so that by the 800s, uh, everything was not all capitals anymore. It, uh, the text became similar to what we would imagine in writing lowercase letters, spaces between words, uh, punctuation at the end of sentences, and that became much easier to deal with. Availability. Uh, I've, I've already mentioned some of this. Um, the c- Christians in the early church didn't have their own Bibles, okay? I have literally 19 Bibles in my office, 17 in English, one Greek New Testament, one Hebrew Old Testament. I have dozens more on my computer, and this is a reality that Christians throughout time would be blown away by, uh, by the fact that they only had a chapter or a book or maybe even just a page of Scripture. We have so much grace given to us by God to have the Bible in our hands, and we ask, well, why was it that so few Christians actually had an entire Bible to themselves? And that is because prior to the 1440s with the invention of the printing press, every text in the world that existed was handwritten. Handwritten. And so in order to have a copy of anything, you either had to pay someone to copy it for you or you had to copy it yourself. And this is a time-consuming process uh, that if you could imagine, um, if you just read the Gospel of Matthew... That might take you, if you're a good, a fast reader, like two hours to read the Gospel of Matthew. If you're a little slower, maybe three, four hours. How long would it take you to copy letter by letter, word by word, the entire Gospel of Matthew? We're looking at a huge time commitment. And so there's a time commitment. There's the difficulty of, of doing this, uh, that they don't have electricity. They don't have glasses. They don't have erasers. Uh, they have to be able to have time to be with the text. They have to have permission to be able to copy a text. Um, not to mention uh, the the danger of copying a text uh, for Christians. Literally until the year three thirteen, persecution was a regular occurrence against Christians. Whether from the Jews or from the Romans, persecution was normal for Christian life in the early centuries of the church, which made it dangerous to own copies of the Bible, made it dangerous to copy uh, the scriptures. It was just dangerous to be a Christian in general. And so there was a lot of obstacles to overcome for people to have their own copies of the scriptures. We even see that with... um, uh, Peter had mentioned in, in 1 Peter that he's writing to Christians that are dispersed because of the persecution under Emperor Nero. So, how is the text surviving? How is it, how is it being uh, preserved? Transmission. Transmission is the copying of manuscripts to preserve them for future generations and distribute them for greater use. Every text of anything, Bible or not Bible, in order for it to survive, had to be transmitted. It had to be copied. That process could have been a formal process or an informal process. Uh, Some people were very controlled and limiting who they allowed to uh, copy their text. But with the New Testament, what we see is that the New Testament operated under a free transmission 
And what that means is there was no requirements that you had to meet in order to be allowed to copy the text. You didn't have to be a professional scribe. It did not have to be your job to read and write in order to have access to the text of the New Testament to copy it. Why? Because Christians believe that the gospel is the only hope of salvation and that the gospel is contained in the New Testament and they want the New Testament to spread as widely as possible. And so anybody who was willing to put their lives in danger of owning the scriptures and copying the scriptures, they would allow them to do that. Slaves, um, just your average Joe, anybody who could write even a little bit, they would let them copy the text of the New Testament so that they could have the Word of God, so that they can know God for themselves and be exposed to the gospel. What does this look like? I want to give just a, a theoretical. Uh, this is not historical what I'm giving you. This is just a theoretical example of how would this work. So Peter wrote in 1 Peter 1, Peter an apostle to Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Peter is writing to Christians who are dispersed because of persecution. He's writing to, to Christians in five different general locations, Cappadocia, Galatia, uh, Bithynia, and Pontus, and Asia. He does not identify a specific church that he's writing to. He doesn't identify who gets the letter first. And so let's just theorize, how could this work? Well, what would happen is that Peter's letter would go somewhere first. Let's say it goes to Cappadocia first. And so the church, a church in Cappadocia, receives this inspired uh, Holy Spirit letter uh, from the Apostle Peter, speaking these incredible truths about an inheritance reserved in heaven for us, and he's encouraging these Christians who are being persecuted by the Roman Empire to continue on in their faith, and these people are blown away by what they learn in this letter, and they want to have a copy of it. And so they copy it for themselves. They have copies for their church. They likely um, go out and find Christians from other Cappadocian churches, and they allow them to copy them. And then as they're reading, they see, oh, wait, this is supposed to go to Galatia and Bithynia and Asia. We have to get a copy to these other Christians. And so let's say they take a copy up to Galatia, and they take a copy to Pontius and Bithynia, and the same thing's going to happen there. These Christians are going to want a copy of this letter. They want to have this word preserved so that they can teach from it and hear from it. And so they make copies. The letter still hasn't gone to all of its destination. It still needs to get to Asia. As we see in the book of Acts and Acts 19, Paul's ministry in Ephesus is a place of flourishing where he stays for several years. And Ephesus is a port city where many people come to do business from all over Asia. Acts 19 says that uh, Paul's teachings about the gospel spread throughout all of Asia because of his ministry in Ephesus. And so Christians from other areas in, in Asia, if they ever come to visit the church in Ephesus... They have the opportunity to hear from this letter of 1 Peter, and they can make a copy. And guess what they can do? They can bring it back to their hometown throughout Asia. And so then you have the letter spreading throughout Asia. And so this is just an example of how the letters in the New Testament were copied, distributed, recopied, distributed, that there's thousands and thousands of Christians in the early church and they want to have the Word of God, and they want others to have the Word of God. And so they allow the text to be copied, and it, it's copied, and it spreads, and it spreads to the various churches. A common accusation against the Bible is that the Bible was produced by people colluding together to purposefully change what was originally written. There are so many accusations that Christians never really believed in the deity of Jesus Christ, but that they added it later. This truly is an impossibility, and it's an impossibility that starts with the New Testament writers themselves. It's a term, uh, I did not make this term, it's called multifocality. Multifocality uh, helps us to see how it's impossible uh, that the New Testament authors work together in order to collude what information was in the New Testament, mainly because uh, 
The books in the New Testament are written by multiple different authors. All of the Gospels have different authors. Paul has his letters. John has his letters. Peter has his. Jude, James. Uh, They all have their own letters. From history and even from the book of Acts, as we see the first century church operating, these authors are never hanging out in the same place, writing at the same place. They're not writing during the same time. Their audiences are not the same, and they're they're not colluding in order to produce information that says, hey, do you got this in yours? I'm going to put this in mine. Hey, you got this in yours? I'm, we're going to put these all together. They're not doing that. It's impossible for them to have done that uh, because of these things, different location, different authors, different audiences writing in different time frames. And so this prevents any deliberate collusion on the part of the authors of Scripture. And additionally, with what we just looked at, free transmission, Uh, of the text, it also eliminates the collusion of those who are copying the scriptures. There's never a place or a time where all of the manuscripts are gathered together that anyone can take the manuscripts and make wholesale changes that would not be able to be detected. That's impossible. There's too many texts spread around too many different areas. There's so many copies that it is impossible for someone to insert something like the deity of Christ or insert the Trinity or take something out without those manuscripts leaving evidence of change. And that's very important for us so that we can see through the manuscripts that we have that uh, though the manuscripts are not identical, they are in such strong agreement that we can detect errors in the places that there's obvious differences. Copyists don't all make the same mistake in the same spot. So if we're all copying, if all of us were to copy a document and I make a mistake in the first line, not all of you are going to make that same exact mistake in the same line. That through the manuscripts we can tell 99 of these manuscripts say the exact same thing here, except for this one. And that one clearly stands out as having an error. And so there's such agreement in the manuscripts. And since there's never a governing body or an authority that has all of the Bibles, all of the manuscripts, nobody can make any changes like that that would be undetected. And so we have a, a really a, a foolproof um, guard against wholesale changes uh, in the scriptures. Let's move on to, this is, all right, this is our like timeline portion uh, of this morning. Uh, These things also are represented on your your fact sheet. Like I said, I know I'm talking fast. I even feel like I'm talking fast. So, all of the New Testament books are finished Uh, by the mid-90s of the first century. That's the the latest, uh, we believe even John's writings are the oldest, uh, finishing in the late 90s. Within 100 years of that time, in the second century, we already have uh, almost total agreement amongst the churches of what books are to be in the New Testament. Uh, We have found the Moratorian Fragment. It's the first list of books uh, that early Christians used to be, uh, to be able to identify these are the books that we believe are in the New Testament. Uh, why there's not total agreement of all 27 of the New Testament books at that time is just because it takes time for the scriptures to uh, spread to the different areas. And once, uh, once that eventually happens, uh, then the church is able to agree Uh, we believe that these books are inspired, and it it just takes time to do that. They don't have the internet, they don't have email, uh, they don't have the technology that we have. Uh, Information spreading in the early centuries just takes a lot longer. And so by the end of the second century, uh, uh, early Christians were in agreement uh, with virtually the entire New Testament that we believe today. What we also find in the second century is that there's already copies of the New Testament in other languages, Latin and Syriac and Coptic. And what does that tell us? That tells us exactly what I explained earlier. People are getting saved. Gentiles are getting saved. And they need the scriptures in their language. And so already within 100 years of the New Testament being completed, 
the scriptures are being translated into other languages and spreading further and further. The Bible is getting out there. Uh, Once again, impossible for all of these documents to have been gathered in a central location for changes to be able to be made uh, without us knowing it. 313 AD, uh, the Edict of Milan. As I mentioned, persecution was a regular event in the life of a Christian in the early centuries. That ended in 313. The Edict of Milan uh, was a Roman government edict that granted Christianity legal status. What that means is from this point on, it's not legal for the Romans to persecute and kill and destroy Christians. So peace becomes a regular uh, reality for Christians starting in 313. Uh, This led to um, uh, many Christians being able to to gather together. We see the the first church council of AD 325, the Council of Nicaea. Uh, This is a very important council, and because it's important, there is tons of misinformation about this council. Uh, There are so many people that believe uh, that the following things are fact, that at the Council of Nicaea, Constantine, who is the emperor of Rome, who is a professing Christian, Constantine created the doctrine of the Trinity, Constantine created the doctrine of the deity of Christ, Constantine determined the books of the New Testament. There are people who believe that those things are fact. None of those things are true. As we saw from uh, P66, uh, that, that papyrus of John's gospel, we already see in the first line from AD 200, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Christians already have believed because the Scriptures have always said that Jesus was God. And so what the Council of Nicaea was dealing with is there was a man named Arius, a heretic, who had a small group of followers who were trying to convince the church that Jesus was not God, that he was a creature created by God and that the Father alone was God. And so the issue of the deity of Christ was under uh, uh, attack and the council convened to silence Arian the heretic and agree upon the deity of Jesus Christ and to confirm that. And that's what the scriptures had taught all along. Uh, They also met to talk about the dating of Easter, uh, but they did not talk about the New Testament or what books were to be in the Bible or anything like that. Later on, 330 AD, just after this, uh, Constantine moved the capital of the, of the empire from Rome to Constantinople. Uh, this is going to be important in the next couple of slides uh, because this starts to show uh, the, the division of the church in the Western church and the Eastern church, uh, and I'll tell you about those differences in a moment. And then what changed the world literally in 380 AD, Emperor Theodosius uh, made Christianity the religion of the empire. And this has numerous theological implications uh, for the world uh, that, uh, I mean, you don't just become a Christian just by being born into a nation, but that was essentially what became normal. Uh, If you're born into the Roman Empire, well, you're a Christian. At this time, uh, the language that people were speaking and the language that the church was wanting to use was Latin. And so there became a need to have the Bible in Latin. Uh, And so a man named Jerome was commissioned to translate the Bible into Latin. Uh, This is where we get the Latin Vulgate. Jerome translated the original Hebrew and Greek into Latin. Uh, The Latin Vulgate uh, was uh, unparalleled in in biblical history because the Latin Vulgate became the Bible of the church for 1,100 years. In particular, the Western church, which would be the, the Holy Roman Empire. With the Latin Vulgate becoming the standard in the Western Church, uh, Greek manuscript production uh, almost completely vanishes from the Western Church. And so the Western Church is different from the Eastern Church. Uh, this, this map here is supposed to just give you an illustration of what the, kind of the lay of the land is at this time. You have in the red, the West, that's the Roman Empire. They speak Latin there. Uh, that's, the, that's the language of the church, the Latin Vulgate. The Byzantine Empire is uh, the Greek church, the, the churches that speak Greek. Um, Constantinople, that's where the new capital is uh, in distinction from Rome. And so in the Byzantine Empire, they're still speaking Greek. They're still copying Greek New Testament manuscripts. Uh, and what we find, uh, if you want all this information, there, there's lots of different text types 
of the manuscripts that we have. There's Western texts, there's Byzantine texts, and then in Northern Africa and in near Alexandria, there's the Alexandrian texts. Uh, the most manuscripts that we have come from the Byzantine Empire. Uh, they're the Byzantine text. They're also called the majority text. Uh, and that's because after the Latin Vulgate, the West wasn't producing Greek manuscripts. The East was, uh, and they did so until they were no longer able to uh, because of the rise of Islam. The church experienced peace from 313 uh, till the beginning of the expansion of Islam in 632. Uh, the green section on that map there is the uh, Islamic Empire. And by the year 750, uh, the Islamic Empire totally took over northern Africa and a large portion of the Byzantine Empire. And then by 1250, even more of the Byzantine Empire. And then by 1500, the Byzantine Empire had been uh, totally overcome uh, by, by Islam. What does that mean for us? Well, uh, during that time, uh, Christians are killed, scriptures are destroyed, churches are destroyed, uh, and this is what had happened in the Eastern Church. And so uh, we see after this, no more Greek New Testament manuscripts are, are being produced um, at all. What was it like during this time uh, using the Bible, how was the Bible being, uh, being talked about and used? Well, with Latin being the language of the church and the Latin Vulgate being the Bible of the church, over time, uh, the areas of the Western church like Spain and France and Germany um, and Italy, their languages started to develop. And so these places stopped speaking Latin, and they started speaking their own languages, Italian, French, Spanish. And so what we found was that uh, the only people actually speaking Latin are the clergy and those who are in the church. The average person is not speaking Latin. And what the church was wrestling with is we don't want the lay person to have the Bible in their own hands because they will come up with false doctrine. And so we need to prevent the lay person from having the Bible. We need to forbid uh, any translation out of Latin into the lay languages to prevent false teaching from spreading. And so the church literally forbid the translation of the Bible out of Latin into any language, literally under the penalty of death. Uh, that if you were to come across a scriptures and even, even possess a Latin Bible and you weren't clergy and you had a Bible study, you could be executed for such a thing. It's a scary times. It's, it is hard to even comprehend that that's how life was for certain Christians, that they could die just for having a Bible study in their house. But people stood up to this and fought against this. Uh, and we see the, the beginnings of the Reformation by a man named John Wycliffe. And John Wycliffe uh, translated the Bible out of Latin into English. Handwritten, printing press still doesn't exist yet. Uh, Wycliffe took not the original languages because he was not trained in them, but he translated the Latin Bible, Old and New Testament, into English. And that's the first English Bible that we have in 1382. Uh, just a few decades later, uh, the world would again change with the invention of the printing press. Uh, and the first Bible to be printed was the Gutenberg Bible, it was a Latin Bible. And this leads us into uh, really um, the era of change uh, with regard to Christianity and the Bible uh, after the invention of the printing press. At this time, uh, the spirit of the Reformation was a desire to go back to the original sources. Uh, people were tired of being told what to believe and not desiring to read translations of information. They wanted to go to the original sources. Uh, it was one of the, the heartbeats of the Reformation, ad fontes, to the sources. And so there was a man named Desiderius Erasmus. He was a Roman Catholic priest. He was one such scholar who wanted to go to the original sources, and he studied the works of Jerome. Jerome, who translated the, the Latin Vulgate. And what Erasmus found in Jerome's writings was that the Vulgate that Jerome had originally translated in 405 was different than the Latin Vulgate that existed at the time of Erasmus. And so Erasmus wanted to create a fresh, a new Latin translation. And in order to do that, in order to support his translation, he needed to have Greek New Testament manuscripts that would support and show how he came up with his Latin translation. 
Erasmus is extremely important because he is the first person to ever print and publish a Greek New Testament. He literally starts uh, a huge ball rolling with Bible translation into other languages. uh, And in God's providence, just at the time of the Reformation, uh, Erasmus is used incredibly by the Lord uh, to spread the Word of God. After his uh, printed New Testament in Greek and Latin uh, was created, uh, he did a couple more revisions on his work between 1519 and 1535. And this is important because Erasmus's texts... His five printed texts are the basis of what's known as the Textus Receptus. Uh, The Textus Receptus is the text that underlies the King James Bible and the New King James Bible. And we're talking about this now because in the next two weeks, this will help you to understand why are our Bible translations not all the same, because the Textus Receptus is a different Greek text than modern translations. And so this is one of the reasons why our Bibles are different, and it starts with Desiderius Erasmus. Erasmus had access to seven Greek New Testament manuscripts. So he had, let's just, for sake of illustration, he had seven pieces of paper, seven Greek texts. He did not have any one text that had the entire New Testament. He had one with everything, with the exception of Revelation, He had one copy of Revelation, he had three copies of the Gospels and the book of Acts, and he had four copies of the epistles. And he used those texts to um, uh, collate those together, to combine them together, to come up with a Greek text that he could match with his Latin translation. The text of Erasmus was used by Martin Luther uh, in the next few decades to translate the Bible into German, uh, which was used in the German Reformation. Uh, Erasmus's text was used by William Tyndale for the first translation of the Bible into English from the original languages. Uh, William Tyndale eventually was executed in 1536. And why was he executed? For translating the Bible out of Latin into English. Uh, He died for that. And his translation was used uh, mightily in the, in the later English translations that would come after him. After Erasmus, there were two other men that picked up his work and kept going. Those men were uh, Robert Estian, who's also known as Stephanus. Uh, he had four different revisions of Erasmus's text. Uh, and if you have ever wondered, how did we get verse divisions in our Bibles? Stephanus is the one who created our verse divisions. Uh, His 1551 edition of his Greek New Testament was the first published and printed uh, text that had verse divisions in it. That's where they come from, from this man, uh, predecessor of uh, Erasmus. Uh, After Stephanus came Theodore Beza. Uh, He is the uh, direct successor to John Calvin in Geneva. Uh, He continued the work and had nine revisions of his own. Uh, of the Greek New Testament. (coughs) And these men are instrumental with Erasmus because their work is what was used by the translators of the King James Bible. King James Bible started its uh, its, uh, committee convening in 1604 and finished in 1611. The King James translators did not use manuscripts, handwritten manuscripts, Uh, like Erasmus did, what they used was the text that Erasmus created along with the texts of Stephanus and uh, Beza. And so these printed texts are what underlies uh, the, the King James Bible of 1611, which are based on the manuscripts that Erasmus could find, uh, the seven manuscripts that he had. These uh, different uh, printed texts, just like Uh, manuscripts that we have today, they're not all identical, though they're not vastly different. Uh, I had mentioned earlier text types. Uh, The text behind the King James Bible and these editions of these men are representative of the Byzantine text type, which is also the majority text. Uh, Those are very almost synonymous terms. So the majority of manuscripts that we have are uh, representative of the Byzantine text, and that's what underlies the King James and the New King James. 
this term, textus receptus. Um, I'm giving you this information because if you do any reading on this subject, uh, textus receptus is a very common term uh, that, they, that it's helpful to know what this is talking about. Uh, it comes from a Latin term, the received text. And this was a term coined by the Elzevir brothers in 1633. Um, after Beza in 1598, uh, the next people to pick up that work of Greek New Testament translation were the Elzevirs uh, in 1633. In their uh, advertising for their product, they called the text the received text. And that's where the Texas Receptus term came from. And that term, Texas Receptus, has traditionally referred to any of the printed texts that come from Erasmus. And so there's, there's not just one Texas Receptus historically, there's approximately 30, and that includes all of Erasmus's, Stephanus, Beza, and all the work that the Elsevier brothers did, uh, that all of their works at different times were referred to as the Texas Receptus or the TR. Today, in modern time, and I meant to bring it in here, I forgot to bring it in here, there is a universally recognized Texas Receptus, and it was created in 1881 by a man named Scrivener. Uh, and what Scrivener did is he created a unique text in that he took the King James Bible and then backed into the Greek readings. Uh, and so his text is, is unique. There's not a Greek New Testament manuscript that reflects uh, the readings in his TR, uh, but all of the, the Texas Receptus uh, texts are compilations of other texts to begin with. What about since the King James Bible? Um, what kind of things have we found in history? Uh, there have been uh, uh, most of the important discoveries that we've found textually have happened in the last uh, 150 years. Um, and so the, some of the more major uh, things that we found uh, in the 1800s were Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus. Uh, these are documents dated around 350 AD. Uh, Codex Sinaiticus is uh, more important in the sense that both of these documents had originally the entire Old and New Testament in Greek. Uh, but Sinaiticus still has preserved the entire Old and New Testament in Greek, and it is the only full New Testament in unseal script. All, all those capital letters, it's the only copy of the New Testament that we have in totality uh, in the unseal script. Uh, when these were discovered, uh, there were two men of Westcott and Hort who took these texts, and they made the first critical text. And so the critical text is the, uh, the basis of the text that underlies our modern Bibles. And so when we're talking about why are Bibles different, well, you have Bibles that are either based on the TR or you have Bibles that are based on the critical text. Uh, literally more than 95% of these two differing texts is, a, is identical. So the difference is really minuscule, and we'll see some of that stuff next week. Uh, the critical text is the, um, was behind the, the ASV of 1901. That was really the first Bible that really started to challenge the use of the King James Bible after the King James had been used for so long. Uh, the modern texts that are being used under, under the Bibles of today uh, come from uh, two different uh, uh, Greek New Testaments, uh, the Nestle Allen text and the United Bible Society text. And these texts, where do they get their information from? If, if Erasmus had seven manuscripts that he created his text from, what are these modern texts using? The modern texts are using everything that we have found to date. That includes more than 5,800 different Greek New Testament manuscripts, uh, including more than 130 different papyrus manuscripts, uh, as well as looking at Sinaiticus and Vaticanus and the same texts that Erasmus used, uh, the Byzantine and majority text manuscripts. So I just spewed at you like a fire hydrant uh, so much information that you cannot possibly process all of it at once, 
Okay, I, I understand that. Um, part of the importance about this subject matter is that you can't just hear it once and then, oh, I'm an expert, I know all this stuff. Um, I, I have listened to hours and hours of lecture on this stuff. I've read many books, and there, there's a reason for that. Number one, I love this stuff. I think that it's fascinating. Um, I could listen to this stuff literally uh, all day long. Number two, the importance of this information cannot be overestimated. You have, have you, you have to know where your Bible comes from. You just, you have to know this. We live in an age where it is unacceptable to be ignorant of where the Bible comes from. Because those who dislike the Bible don't want you to know where your Bible comes from. They want to take what information they can get, and they want to distort it so that they make you doubt the truth of God and the truth of His Word. I don't want you to doubt God's Word. There's no reason to doubt God's Word. God has given us so much information and so much support for the Bible that we can know for certain that God is speaking to us through His Word, that we have the gospel, that we know who He is and what He is like. And it is not something that Christians over time just fabricated and added into the text. These things are totally impossible. And we'll get to see more details about why that is next week when we look at textual variance and what that means and why you should not be afraid. Uh, it's, my whole goal in these three weeks is to help you have the information so that you can use your brain and think critically about it. You don't need somebody to just give you all the answers. You have a brain. You can figure these things out. You just need the information. You need the information and a framework by which to look at it. God is trustworthy. His word is reliable. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, God, we thank you for your provision of your word and we thank you for preserving your word for us. God, without your word, we, we literally are just groping around in darkness. We don't have any hope. We don't know where to go. And so, God, you have given us your word, and it is a light to our feet, and it guides us in the way in which we, we are to go. Lord, I know um, that I have given the flock a lot of information this morning, and I pray that you would help them to not feel overwhelmed. I pray that you would help them um, to feel confident in you and that you would give them a desire uh, to listen to this again and to listen slowly and listen carefully uh, that they might understand uh, very important things about your word, that they might grow in an understanding of, of where your word comes from. Lord, help them to see that this week is uh, laying the foundation for the next two weeks um, so that building upon this foundation will help uh, to make so many of our questions and answers make sense. And I just pray, God, that you would help us to trust you in this age of uncertainty and help us to honor you through it. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.